Good evening, friends, and welcome to another edition of Crime Time with Duty Ron and Ed Wallace. We are retired New York City police detectives and 9-11 World Trade Center first responders. Hey, if you like all things true crime related from the police detective's perspective, please consider hitting the subscribe button. Hit that notification bell so you'll get all things Duty Ron and this guy right here, Ed Wallace, when we go live or upload another video. Hey, tonight we're going to talk to you about the dramatic closing arguments in the Michelle Traconis trial. We're on verdict watch right now. And Jennifer Farber Dulos, mother of five, murdered May 24th of 2019, it's alleged, by the prosecution. But again, folks, we need to focus on Michelle Traconis. She stands charged with conspiracy to commit murder um, and a host of other uh, things, conspiracy to commit murder, evidence tampering, hindering prosecution. Those are just a few to name. Ed, I wanted to get your take, but I first wanted to see how you're doing tonight. What's your, uh, you know, what's your feeling on this, the vibe of this trial? You've been following this thing very closely. We haven't done an update in, in, in quite a few weeks just because things have gotten busy. But what's your take on what we saw today? You know, we had some strong... Uh, closing statements from the two defense, uh, from the one defense attorney and also the two state district attorney prosecutors. They really did a fabulous job. Yeah, I agree 100 percent. And I, I saw some of our our um, our chatters uh, there as well. Uh, Debbie was there and a few others. Um, but I really think the um, the uh, prosecutor did a bang up job uh, in the morning um, closing statement as opposed to uh, the afternoon closing statement. I believe um, they she was able to lay out this succinctly um, the movements. And um, it was like it was beautiful. It was like putting a, a piece, uh, a puzzle together and showing how each piece led to the next piece and how it all came together in a nice, neat package as opposed to um, the defense. Now, I always talk about here on, on our channel, Occam's razor, right? And the principle being, the theory being that all things being equal, the e, the e, um, all things being equal, the um, simplest of explanations always tends to be the truth, okay? Because, it, you know, and you can see how with the prosecutors laying it out, the timeline, the movements, the videos, they got it all nailed down. OK, what you what you got with the defense is this mission, gosh, of mud thrown here, mud thrown there, mud going there, mud going there. And in order for their theory, because I mean, they're going to blame it on somebody else, like she had nothing to do with this. She knew nothing. All right. Mm. But it doesn't jive with common sense. It doesn't jive with her movements. It doesn't jive with her lies and what she said in her three different interviews. Okay. I agree with you. The prosecutor, Michelle Manning, she really did a bang up job in the morning. She really put all of the ducks in order, so to speak, and showed the jury exactly what the state's case was about. And then when the afternoon came and prosecutor Sean McGinnis got up, he also did his little bit of wrapping up and tying that bow and, you know, just really finishing this thing off and um i was i was impressed uh, but like you said in the morning she really did an unbelievable job of really directing the jury to and it was the jury uh, in this case is six right correct me if i'm wrong it's not what we normally would see this smaller number uh but at the end of the day this criminal defense attorney i don't know about you ed but throughout this whole trial he did it he did his job, but he really, I'm a, I don't know if I'm, I'm being a little too harsh on him, but he really irked me just listening to him and all of the delays. I think that that had also a lasting uh, impression on, on the, uh, on the jurors as well. What, what do you think about that, Ed? And what do you oh, guys think in the chat? Absolutely. I a hundred percent agree. I think he's alienating himself from the jury and that tends to have backlash on the defendant. I told right. you the story, right? where this defense attorney was cross-examining me and he was acting like a real uh, SOB. And, and you know, he was totally out of line. And to the point where 
one of the jurors blurted out loud and everybody in the courtroom, including the judge, and we all looked in the direction of the jury when, when it was said. And basically what the person said was, this attorney's an asshole. <laughs> and, Pardon my French, but you're an asshole. Is that what they said? Thank you, Cameron. Okay. And in his closing argument, he literally said, don't convict my client because you think I'm an asshole. Wow. <laughs> Amazing. This guy came pretty close. This guy came pretty close. Um, let's listen to this little piece and get everybody all set up and what we're going to talk about here. We got a good hour. Uh, hashtag duty Ron, hashtag Ed. And don't forget to vote in the poll. What will the verdict be for Traconis? What do you think? We have choices of guilty, not guilty, and a hung jury. Um, 267 votes so far. Take a, take a moment to vote. It's pinned at the top of the chat. Uh, let's take a listen to this. This is from NBC Connecticut. The Michelle Traconis trial is now in the hands of a jury. Closing arguments wrapped up on both sides today in Stanford. The jury was charged, and now we're waiting for a verdict. That's right. NBC Connecticut's Kevin Geis has been there since day one. He joins us now live from Stanford. So, Kevin, what was laid out in these closing arguments? Well, Mikeisha, this is the first time we heard state prosecutors lay out the entire case in front of the jury after nearly five weeks of testimony, as well as evidence. Now, they did it in front of the five Dulos children who were present in court today, as well as multiple police investigators that were involved in this case. The defense, of course, pushing back on all allegations as well as evidence. But now the case is in the jury's hand. He needed an alibi. He needed the defendant. State prosecutors weaving together over five weeks of evidence and testimony attempting to tie Michelle Traconis to the death of Jennifer Dulos on May 24th, 2019. The defendant provided assistance and aid to Fotis Dulos. They allege Michelle Traconis knew Fotis was planning on murdering Jennifer, and she too had motive to want Jennifer dead. They claim the evidence shows she manipulated Fotis Dulos's phone while he was in New Canaan, including answering a pre-planned phone call, aided Fotis in the cleanup, and helped destroy or dispose of evidence both on Albany Avenue and in the Toyota Tacoma. She acted as his alibi during the murder. She conspired to tamper with the physical evidence of the murder, intentionally aided in covering it up at 80 Mountain Spring Road, at Albany Avenue in Hartford, and at Russell Speeders in Avon. The defense asserting the state has not met its burden of proof and spent their hour of closing argument cutting strengths the state used to tie their case. The state is asking you to speculate that there is evidence where there is none, but the absence of evidence, the absence of evidence is not evidence. Defense attorney John Schoenhorn offering the jury alternatives to the state's largely circumstantial evidence, like memory issues or language barriers during interviews, explaining inconsistencies, calling into question the reliability of state police investigators and witnesses like Pavel Gumieni, and asking jurors to consider why Fotis would hurt his wife when he was making progress toward getting his kids back. This nefarious plot under those circumstances makes no sense. Why then? Why at that moment is he going to then plot with his girlfriend to, to kill Jennifer? It was state prosecutors getting the final word, and that word, coincidences, for the jury to consider and passing the baton to jurors. You write the third act of this script with your verdict. What's the ending going to be? Jurors were given the case a little after four today. They wrapped up at about 445. Now, it is important to note that each charge, the verdict has to be unanimous. We're live in Stanford. Kevin, guys. So there you have it, Ed. I wanted to play that. Yes, six jurors who heard 25 days of evidence from state prosecutors and two and a half, from, two and a half days from the defense. They're deliberating whether the state proved beyond a reasonable doubt that Traconis is guilty of the six charges levied against her. Um, you know, I just want to clear something up, though, before we move on, because the people, uh, the story I told folks about was a case that I was testifying in, not this case where the juror made that statement that you know everybody in the courtroom heard, including the judge, and his during the closing argument that was in the case that I was in, and no, the juror didn't get kicked out. There you have it. Ed's cleaning up, uh, cleaning up the statement. And yeah. Sometimes things get misconstrued, as you know. Yeah, people online. were thinking it was this trial, and I said, no, no. 
All right. Well, everybody that's watching the replay will um will get on to the will they'll get put put in uh clarification is put in place. Um Court TV went over the timeline from the beginning. Uh I wanna in a minute play a little bit of that. But Ed, you know, everybody wants to know, like, you know, what's our thoughts? Do we feel that the state proved beyond a reasonable doubt all of the six charges levied against the defendant? And I'll go first. I feel that they have. Um, there was a time in the middle of this trial and even towards the latter end, you know, the latter part of it, towards the end, I, I, I still felt that they hadn't. But but really, today and, and, and some of the days leading up to this, I felt confident that they really laid it out. And there was a lot of discussion on the defense side. He kept bringing up Fotis Dulos, not his client, he kept bringing up Fotis. And that, I think, is also going to hurt the defense here because he really didn't mention his client a lot. He really mentioned Fotis quite a bit. So over to you, Ed, on your thoughts. I thought you know, the prosecution put on a reasonable case and they dotted their I's and crossed their T's. Um, the, the, the leg work the gumshoe work, if you will, the shaking doors with the shaking hands with doorknobs, uh, the canvassing of the neighborhood, retrieving all of this video evidence of the movements. And uh, a, this, despite what the defense says, it's May. There's a video of um, of the uh, neighbor's kid in shorts and a T-shirt. And the only one in the house is uh, MT and she's burning something in the fireplace. Yeah. Okay. And you know it was an it was a motion activated camera. I wish it would have been on uh, you know all the time in recording, but it was motion activated. So you know we just got pieces of when the smoke was coming out of the chimney, and so we you know we don't know how long these things were um, smoke was coming out of the chim chimney, but right. we do know based upon these movements how many times she went back and forth, and it yeah. defies logic. It defies logic. Uh, that she wasn't burning evidence in the fireplace. Yeah. Okay. So Ed Wallace, you're saying that they have um, proven their case and we should see a guilty verdict here? I think so. Okay. All right. So we said it right there, right out of the gate. Um, uh, I see Julie Moskowitz is in the chat. We're sending her prayers and strength. She just lost her husband just a few short days ago. So prayers to you, Um on the loss of Dr. Ed Moskowitz. So there's Julie in the chat. Wanted to just send her all our love on behalf of Ed and myself and the entire community here. Um, so what do you guys think in the chat? I always like to engage with the chat. Let us know if you feel that the state has proven their case. I know we have a poll, but put a one in the chat if you think they have. Put a two if you think that they haven't. Just a, a, a yes or a no. One for yes, they've proven their case beyond a reasonable doubt too you feel no we can you can go to the pinned comment for the hung jury i just want to see how many people are kind of on the fence here uh what do you got ed there's a question here uh, ed why do you think the fireplace trace evidence was not found or introduced i think it's because they didn't see it uh in time didn't didn't recognize the smoke coming out of the uh, chimney of the fireplace and by the time they did uh it had all been cleaned up and was out of there so there you have it. Um, Ed, I want to play this little piece. It's from NBC2. Um, let's, ooh, CBS, I mean, CBS2. Right now at 5.30, the Michelle Traconis case is now in the hands of the jury. You write the third act of this script with your verdict. What's the ending going to be? Tonight, the latest twist in this high-profile case as both sides present their closing arguments. Good evening. I'm Christine Johnson. And welcome back. I'm Maurice Dubois. Traconis is accused of murder, conspiracy, and covering up the evidence in the death of a Connecticut mother, Jennifer Dulos. CBS 2's Tony Aiello was at the courthouse in Stamford for today's dramatic closing argument. Michelle Traconis showed a variety of emotions as she listened intently. The defense... Michelle simply did not know. And the prosecution. This defendant hated Jennifer Dulos. Painting very different pictures of Draconis's nature and actions. She's accused of conspiring with Fotis Dulos to kill his estranged wife, Jennifer, 
mother of five children, and then helping Dulos dispose of evidence and hinder investigators. He died by suicide after being charged with murder. Whatever Fotis Dulos did, it was not for or because of Michelle, and it was not with her. Fotis put up a facade until his last poisoned breath. Defense attorney John Schoenhorn said the case is built on speculation, conjecture, and guesswork, including about her trip with Dulos when he tossed bloody evidence. And the police thought Michelle knew what was in them, but she didn't. No. And he criticized tactics during Traconis's three voluntary interviews with investigators. They threatened her. They scared her. They lied to her. Prosecutor Sean McGinnis fired back, using graphics to ask about 30 suspicious coincidences. Is it just a coincidence that the defendant lied and said she showered with Dulos when he was actually en route to murder his wife? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant lied about seeing Dulos in the office again while he was in New Canaan murdering his wife? This defendant was undoubtedly part of this plan to kill Jennifer Dulos. Under Connecticut law, this jury is comprised of just six people. They deliberated briefly Tuesday afternoon and will be back in the jury room Wednesday morning. So I thought that that was compelling when the prosecutor put out those 30 coincidences. Is this a coincidence? He just went on and on and on with it. That was a lot of information. I thought that was powerful for the jury. Uh, six jurors under state Connecticut state law, like some people in the chat, like Schmidt, was asking why, why just six? That's what it is. We just heard it here from Tony Aiello, who is a longtime crime reporter for uh, CBS New York. Yeah, uh, now he's up in Connecticut? Or- yeah, yeah, they sent him up there on assignment. It's close. Yeah. It's, it's really just a hop, skip, and a jump away. Mm-hmm. Um, but I wanted to just say that, Ed, did you see how many number ones were in I believe that the majority of our audience feels that the state proved their case. I saw one number three, which was undecided, and one number two, and then that was it. Mm -hmm. So um, it sounds like like the state, um, at least here for this limited audience that we have, um, according to our live chatters and our true crime connoisseurs, uh, the state has proven their case. But Ed, you were so (coughs) impressed. With the um, with the female prosecutor Michelle Manning, she went first. The defense went second, and because the state has the burden of proof, they get last licks, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, I want to I want to go to that, but before I go to it, I think you saw something in the chat. Did you see anything in the chat? No, um, I think I answered out everything I saw so far. Um, but. Uh, yeah, hundred percent right. You know, I mean, the defense case. I, um, at the let's go. I mean, the male the male prosecutor at the end. You know, they pay a seven hundred dollar an hour expert witness on memory. Yeah, she was hard. And and she has her own memory issues. She oh my god, she couldn't yeah. remember anything. Okay, yeah. that was <laughs> said, I said, you want to talk about defining uh, irony? Okay. A memory expert that can't remember, okay, yes. and mm-hmm. and trying to blame the inconsistencies and the lies between the three different interviews uh, based upon th- what she said and the other expert about the um, language, um, you know, it, you know, that was just throwing stuff against the wall to see what can stick to try to create some reasonable doubt. But it, you know, like I said, it becomes convoluted again. Occam's razors, the simplest of explanation tends to be the truth. The more right. twists and turns you have to take to wiggle your client out of this, yeah. the worse it looks for your client and the less reasonable it is for your client uh, actions, okay? If you have to make a right and then a left and then a right and a left to go straight, <laughs> yeah, okay, it, it's, it doesn't work. A lot of people are agreeing. They said Mel Mack here saying it was embarrassing. Barbara says it was cringeworthy. Um, yeah, and, and so many things. Uh, this trial lasted a long time. I never thought there it, it was like we we saw no light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak. But um, you know, when right out of the gate, what really bothered me is when um, the defendant here, Michelle Traconis claim that she needed a Spanish interpreter and she needed those headphones. That really pissed me off because I saw the inter- interview and interrogation and I know that this woman speaks and understands English well. 
Uh, you know, it's not her first language, but she is able to communicate in it. And she was communicating in that, like that into, in the English language as her predominant language when she was dealing with people business wise, friendship wise. So now when it comes to court, the added expense of having those headphones and there was the snafus of when it wasn't working, they held up the court. I mean, I don't know. Maybe I'm just nitpicking here, but that was like right out of the gate gave me like, you know, like bad vibes with it. Like, you know, that she was really trying to squeeze the system here. Um, but it is what it is. And look, you know, we have all different types of defendants that come into the courtroom. Some that want to you know, represent themselves. Uh, we've seen many, many notable trials where it's a circus and the defendant is, you know, taking over the courtroom. We had Adam Montgomery who refused to go into court. And now we have the perp um, in our most recent case um with uh o over in um why, why am i losing my my train of thought here uh he, he was supposed to go to court today Can somebody please correct me in the chat because I'm, ha I'm having a brain fart this is a com coming up to 60 uh but audrey uh cunningham uh in the that case the defendant refused to put his pants on and go to court it's all coming back to me i didn't even need the chat uh, but yeah, it's it just insane what goes on in court. But, you know, I felt like she really w tried to work the system. And as the, 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 the prosecutor said, she conveniently had memory lapses when it would be incriminating to herself. But she remembered all of the details that really wouldn't incriminate the Superficial herself. details that had nothing Correct. to do with anything. Correct. Like so, the fact yeah. that Starbucks was out of chocolate uh, croissants or whatever the case may be. <laughs> yeah. All right, give yeah. me a break. Yeah. So yeah, that that was who I was referring to, the perp McDougal. Um, mm -hmm. and he 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 refused to put his pants on and go to court. He's sitting in his cell with his with with you know no pants on. And when I heard that and read that today, I just shook my set my head and I said like things that make you go hmm. And there was um a video of one of the either the corrections officers or court officers. I think it was a, a CO. Uh, he was begging with them, come on, please put, you know, put, come on, let's go. Come on. What are you, what are you doing? I was just like, really in Texas, come on. We would have, we would have went in there and, and uh, put his pants on for him. Yeah, exactly. Um, so let's take a listen. I fast forwarded to some of the finer points here. The prosecutor who went first this morning, um, Michelle Manning, he laid this case out in such fine detail. Um, it was over 35, 40 minutes of presentation for her. It was, it was, you know, they took their time because this is an important case, you know? So um, let's, let's let that play. And here's one from Deb. Uh, she says, hashtag Ed, do you think that honestly a jury would find her not guilty with all the evidence presented? And do you think she knows where Jennifer's remains are? That's a good I think question. the jury will find her guilty. I, I I think, you know, six reasonable persons looking at that evidence the way I saw it and the way I understood it um, can make an honest um, decision and understanding that, yes, she was involved. She did assist in the um, planning and the cover up and the destruction of evidence. I think those are no brainers. Mm -hmm. As for the um, other part of the question, um, I think she knows where the body is the, or the body parts are. I absolutely feel the same way. Um, and there's no, nobody to, I mean, for me, if you're riding with your man and she's riding with him through the, 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 the tough streets of Hartford, th these rich people don't go to Hartford. They stay away from Hartford and she's rolling around from garbage can to garbage can with him with bags in the back of the truck. Um, and she's trying to play stupid and like, oh, I had no idea what, you know, what was in yeah. there or what was in yeah, Come on, lady. Right, right. And yeah. I was uh, I was just uh, trying to get the gum off my hand, wiping it off on the curb. Yeah, so she, she opened about... the door. She opened the door specifically to block the driver from seeing what her boyfriend was doing with the FedEx package in the garbage can. And she, you know, she was distracting him while he was waiting to pull out of that driveway. Right. Exactly. <clears throat> Uh, I agree wholeheartedly with that. And that, and that's, you know, the only reasonable 
explanation of her opening that door, she is not going to go and pick up a piece of gum on the on the dirty streets of Hartford. And I listen, don't 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 hate the messenger on this one, but that's the fact. That's the right. hard truth. They just came from Starbucks, right? Yeah. Did they did they not have a napkin? Come on. She's full of right. shit. Give me a uh, break. Yeah, it's it's ridiculous. Um, Fuzzy Doxy uh, chiming in. Who who wipes their hand on the sidewalk? Right. 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 You know. So um, crazy. Um, Ronnie saying the same thing. Ronnie A. Who wipes gum on the ground? Most people will throw the gum. Throw the gum instead. Jeez. That's, you know? that's what I keep saying. If like if the if I need to go straight, if I'm a defense, but I I want my client to go straight ahead to get to a point at the other end. But what the defense does is they make right, make left. They start doing a series of serpentines <laughs> to get to the end point. It doesn't make sense. Ridiculous, ridiculous. Uh, thank you so much for the super chat. Uh, Rachel says, uh, just wanted to say, I just recently found your channel. A lot of people are here new. And if you're new, let us know just by saying, hey, I'm new. Hi. I saw Twyla in the chat. Hi, Twyla. She said, I'm just recently found your channel, and I appreciate all that you and Ed put into giving the public your professional opinion. And, and listen, we appreciate that, and we thank you, and we're honored that you're here. You're we welcome. are not, you know, we're not criminal defense attorneys. We are, you know, retired detectives, and we know the criminal justice process and the system. We've both testified at many different court proceedings, from grand juries to trials to everything in between. So we have a lot of experience dealing with prosecutors, dealing with defense attorneys, and um, you know, dealing with the state, um, you know, district attorneys. And that's why we're very comfortable and there's no script here. Ed and I, we just say we're gonna cover this, or we're gonna go live, we're gonna do this. There's no strategy meetings, there's no nothing. We just go off the cuff and really just give it to you from our experiences uh in the field of the criminal justice system. So Thank you for that super chat. And there's a couple more. Wendy Craft, thank you for becoming a member. Uh, Jeep Girl, we already highlighted you and a few others for coming in. Thank you, guys. All right, so let's let's take a peek at Michelle Manning. And then at the end, we'll take some questions from the chat because I know that everyone has questions. And let's look at the um, let's look at the poll real quick. Community top chat. Um, what do we got? Where is the poll? Hold on. There it is. Okay, the poll was put up 57 minutes ago. There's almost a thousand votes. Actually, this one says 620. The other one says 890. I don't know which one. I, all right, we'll go with the six 620 votes. Um, we are looking at predominantly all guilty, a few not guilty, and a very small percentage on hung jury. We'll go into this at the end. So stick around at the end. I'll give you the results of the poll. You guys already know it's pretty overwhelming. Everybody, everybody's saying majority is saying guilty. What do you got, Mad Wabbit? Mad Wabbit. Wabbit said, "Hey Ed, could I sit in on your training classes?" Of course you could. Uh, just uh, the next time I'm in Texas, you gotta let me know where you are in Texas, and then I could see if I can uh, have you swing by. Bingo, Yahtzee. All right, I'll take that down. Let's go to our. District Attorney, she's in the middle of presenting her closing, not closing, final arguments. Let's listen. The defendant and photos duelists have their dinner party. Hutch Haynes, his wife, the Reichs, there's a celebration, a toast to the light at the end of the tunnel. But they had already moved the car, and they had already sent up the text message. So what were they toasting? Well, they were toasting what they were going to do the next morning. After the Reichs left and the Haynes left, what happened? The defendant and Fotis Dulo solidified their plan. At around 10 o'clock in the evening, they texted again. Fotis Dulo texted his good friend from Greece, specifying the time, 3.30, yours, which is 8.30 in Connecticut. Just enough time for Michelle Traconis to drop her daughter off at school and return to Fort Jefferson Crossing to answer the call the next day. A call she knew what time it was coming. Is it just coincidence that she happened to be in the office at the exact moment that photos told Andreas to Giardis to call him? Or is it reasonable, based on the motive and based on the evidence, that she knew what time that call was coming and she made sure to answer it? 
you know, early the next morning at 5.35 in the Otis Dulles leaves Aiden Mountain Road and he drives to New Canaan and his employees to Toyota Tacoma with a bike in the back of the truck. And he leaves his phone with Michelle Traponis. This is all evidence of Photos Dulos and the defendant's intent to murder Jennifer. And that murder is the overt act in furtherance to conspiracy. But Photos Dulos needed help to commit that murder. He needed an alibi. He needed the defendant. So what is the defendant doing while Photos Dulos is driving down to New Canaan? When he's southbound on the Merritt Parkway at the Fairfield Rest Area at 636, or at the New Canaan Rest Area at 703? What about when he's riding a bike up Weed Street the direct path between Waveney Park and 69 Wells Lane. Or at 7.57 when the school bus camera captures that Toyota Tacoma secreted in a cutout across from Waveney Park. Or at 8.05 when Jennifer returns home after dropping her children off the last time they will see their mother. Sad. What is... The defendant doing while Jennifer is being assaulted and killed in the garage of 69 Wells Lane. Photos to is is overt act. Or Michelle Traconis doesn't have to be at 69 Wells Lane. She is not charged with the murder. She is charged with conspiracy to commit the murder. Hmm. It's Photos to who committed that overt act. I just want to say, Ed, that, you know, here's Ronnie A. Uh, saying, I wonder what the kids are thinking. They were in the courtroom today. It must be mixed feelings to hear the case firsthand. Especially yes. the way she's laying this out and hearing, you know, what their father is uh, accused of doing. Him. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he, he in a cowardly fashion, took his own life uh, by uh, turning the car on. I covered this live, actually. I had a live helicopter shot. Uh, over the estate where he committed the suicide by carbon monoxide poisoning. And um, people were like, um, you know, trying to, like, there was, to try, people were trying to say, that's not him, it's somebody else. I knew that it was him in there. And um, he, he took his life in a cowardly fashion. And it, it, these kids, again, have to, live with this for the rest of their lives. They, they are the victims, the, you know, her, her mom, Jennifer, du, Jennifer Farber Dulos. I don't even like to call her Dulos. Jennifer Farber's mom is 88 years old and she stepped up and she's got those kids and now is taxed with raising five kids. And we know how difficult it is. And I only have two, uh, you know, they're grown, but you know, it wasn't easy raising two with a husband and wife in place. Now this eighty-eight-year-old woman, um, you know, is is raising these kids. So it's it's a horror show. Remember Mark Davison's testimony? There were a minimum of two impacts. This wasn't a fall where she hit her head. We saw the blood splatter on the car, on the undercarriage of two cars, the garage floor, the garbage cans. You can make the reasonable inference that this was an anger-driven assault on Jennifer, and she died as a result. Then there's the cover-up, the clean-up in the garage, the swipes, the paper towels that were missing <clears throat> that Lauren Almeida put out the next the day before, the bucket that was missing from the garage. And don't forget the DNA on the faucet. Recall Matt Riley and Kristen Medell's testimony. Matt Riley took a swab off of that faucet because there was a blood-like stain that in his training experience he determined was evidentiary and he took a swab from that blood like stain and it contained Jennifer and Photos Dulos' DNA 4.3 times, 4.3 billion times more likely to occur. Recall Kristen Medell's testimony on that. Did that blood like stain, well, let me ask you this Did that blood like stain with Photos Dulos' DNA come from a cake two days before? Or is it more likely that he missed a spot? After he is done cleaning up the garage at 1025, Fotis drives to the suburban away from 69 Wells Lane. At 1030, it's in the same direction and route back to Waveney Park. 
where it is later found by New Canaan PD with the battery dead and the car in reverse. Drives back the Merritt Parkway. Under Trooper LeBeau's testimony, you make the call. It's your opinion, your memory that controls. But I submit to you, this is a bike in the back of his truck. Oh, yeah. And don't forget the Tour de France imprint on the tape that was found out of Harper. During this entire morning, Photo Stubles doesn't have his phone on him. Why wouldn't he want his phone on him? Well, there's two reasons. One, he doesn't want his location tracked. I think that's a reasonable inference you can make. But two, he needs somebody to manipulate it. He needs somebody to manipulate it at four Jefferson crossings so it looks like he is home. So it looks like he's taking a shower. So it looks like he is in the office. So it looks like he is answering calls. We all know who that someone is. Michelle Traconis. Look at all the text messages that were not answered that morning and all the phone calls that were not answered except for one, planned one. Make no mistake, she knew exactly what she was doing when she answered that phone. How do you know? It was planned, the timing, but also she doesn't talk about the call at all in her first two interviews. After all, the call was not on her alibi script. And make no mistake, we call them timelines, but they are alibi scripts. That call is not on her alibi script. A lot of other calls are. But conveniently, that one's not on it. It's on Fotis's. After all, it's supposed to be his alibi. Are all those things consistent with the defense's theory that she didn't know anything? I submit to you, they're consistent with one thing, her guilt. By the way, at 1025, when Fotos Dulos is driving Jennifer Suburban to Waveney Park, Fotos' good friend, the one who called at 826, coincidentally sends this mean. Uh, why is he sending that meme at that time? That was weird. Coincidence? Or does that just show the intent behind that 826 phone call? User manipulation. Mike Clark testified that when somebody manipulates the phone, they turn it, they unlock it, it gets recorded. Now, the only person who could have looked reasonably manipulated photos to his phone that morning is Michelle Traconis. There's some evidence of Kent Winnie. He came to the office at 721 and 841, but the phone was manipulated before 721, before he arrives, and it was manipulated after he leaves. The defendant is the only person who could have reasonably manipulated that phone and the only person who had reason to manipulate that phone. At 644, the phone is unlocked. 645, 646, it's turned. Orient orientation change, 701. 701, the phone is unlocked again. 807, unlocked again. All this while he is en route on the, in the Toyota Tacoma and on the bike and in the garage. At 8.26, she answers the call and puts it on speakerphone. At 8.31, it's unlocked again. And at 9.03, after Kat Mowini leaves, it's unlocked again. This is the conspiracy. Now I wanna talk about the cover-up. There are multiple charges, but as I said, this is simple. It is all connected because the acts and behaviors of what she did what Michelle Traconis does before, during, after, and the statements, the omissions, and the lies are all what we call circumstantial evidence. And they're all circumstantial evidence for each and every charge. After all, you don't shake hands and plan to murder somebody at a dinner party. Look at the cleanup between 1222, when the Toyota Tacoma returns, in 710 prior to driving to Albany Avenue. 
These acts go hand in hand with counts one, two, and three. The Toyota returns at 1222. And then the defendant and Photos Dulos both go to 80 Mountain Spring at approximately 135. And from 135 until 458, when Pavel Gomini shows up, Photos Dulos never leaves 80 Mountain Spring Road. For three and a half hours, he never leaves an empty property. It is reasonable to assume that he needs that amount of time to clean the Tacoma and to prepare the garbage bags for Hartford. Michelle Tracona submits in her own interviews that she went back and forth to 80 Mountain from Fort Jefferson Crossing that afternoon, but she says she only did it two to three times, depending on which interview you watch. But look at her interviews. She admits and lies about things only when they're incriminating. There were five trips that day, not two to three. Trip one, 136 to 141. She stays at 80 Mountain Spring Road for five minutes before returning to Fort Jefferson Crossing. Trip number two, 201 to 224. She returns to 80 Mountain Road, stays for 23 minutes before returning to Fort Jefferson Crossing. And trip number three, at 355 to 404, she stays for nine minutes. What is she doing between trips two and three? Between 224 and 355 when she is alone at Fort Jefferson Crossing. Hmm. She's burning something. Then she's not burning something. And then she's burning something again. Remember, there were three separate fire events, ladies and gentlemen, this is two of them. And she is alone at Fort Jefferson Crossing while the fire is going on. How do we know that she's alone? We don't see any other cars leave 80 Mountain Spring Road. Her own admission in her interviews for driving the Jeep in the Suburban and Photos Dulles' phone location. Mike Clark's testimony, it stays at 80 Mountain Spring Road during the time of those fires. Now we go to trip four. Michelle Traconis goes back to 80 Mountain Road. She stays for 35 minutes between 423 and 458 when Pavel Gomini shows up. Then Pavel Gomini leaves, Michelle Traconis backs out of the driveway and photos dual leave. They all leave together. And at this moment, she takes the keys to the Toyota Tacoma to prevent Pavel from taking the car for the weekend. After all, they need more time. They haven't gone to the car wash yet. Look at her alibi script. Look at her interviews about what she says and doesn't say about the keys. But Pavel's insistent he wants his truck for the weekend. He wants that motorbike. So she has to return the keys. And she stays for four minutes to return the keys. And she goes back to Fort Jefferson Crossing. Ed, what do you think she was burning? Evidence, clothing, paper towels, the black hoodie, the, the black sweatsuit that he was wearing when he was riding the bicycle, the mask, uh, any gloves that he was wearing, um, the paper towels, uh, things that he may have used in the garage to clean up there, things that he may have used um, at this property to clean up the Tacoma. Uh, it, I, 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 I'm gathering it was a bloody mess. And, you know, he's trying to clean up as much as possible. Uh, in addition, uh, <clears throat> you know, what did they do with that body? Okay. Now, there was talk here in the chat, if we believe that uh, it had something to do with the this discovered grave um, at the club. Uh, I, I, you know, the possible grave, right, is, is, the, is, is what is there. Um, maybe, maybe that was the original plan, but they couldn't do it, you know. And you now she's laying this out so perfectly, and it's so reasonable. Okay, there is no, there's no equivocation here. All right, there's no vacillation. Everything she's saying is is just falling in line and making perfect sense. All right, it's going from point A to point B. All right, and all the other explanations by the defense attorney just does not make sense when you listen to this. Yeah. Absolutely. Hello, Mally Swift. Thank you for being here. She says the closing arguments were excellent. And I want to say thank you to Mally, Mally Swift. She supports 
a great amount of true crime creators. I'm bringing us back up to uh, highlight uh, Maui Swift. She is in many, many different chats. I see her around all the time, and she's so darn supportive. And I want to say thank you, not only just to Maui Swift, but to folks like her who are always there to, you know, support, give great commentary, leave great questions, ask those tough questions, also being respectful and also being a great part of this community. Maui, you are what makes this a great place and many, many others. Let's continue because it gets it, it gets a little bit better here. And we have a fire event. These acts, including her statements, are all circumstantial evidence of her agreement to conspire with Fotos Dulos to murder Jennifer and to tamper with evidence and being an accessory to tampering with evidence. When I talk about tampering, I'm going to count two, three, four, and five. Counts two and three have to do with May 24th and the events at Albany Avenue. And counts four and five have to do with the Tacoma and Russell Speeders on May 29th. The elements the state has to prove for conspiracy to commit tampering is the agreement. And agreement with Botus Dulos to commit the crime of tampering. Tampering itself is knowing a criminal investigation is pending. And I submit to you that it is a reasonable inference a criminal investigation is going to, going to commence when you commit a crime like murder. And that evidence was tampered with. In counts two and three, that is very simple. That's all the items that came out of Albany Avenue. Jennifer's bra, her shirt, the zip ties. And for counts three, four, and five, that's the Toyota Tacoma. There has to be an intent to deceive, and there is a clear intent to deceive, to destroy evidence when you throw it in the garbage can on Albany Avenue, or when you take the vehicle you use to commit the crime to a car wash and ask for two extra details on the interior. The overt act, well, here, straightforward, the defendant traveled with photos to Willis to Harper to dispose of the evidence, and you specifically intend to enter that agreement and commit the crime of tampering. She's also charged with being an accessory to tampering. Accessory requires simply that you intentionally aid Fotis Dulos in tampering with the evidence. This is both for Hartford and Russell Speeders. She 100% did, did that. What did the defendant and Fotis Dulos do next? It's all very clear. It's on video. And C4. Please watch the C4 videos again. I'm not giving enough time to show them to you, uh, but I am going to draw your attention to one of those videos. Specifically, the Albany and Blue Hill camera. It's also on Adam Street at around 740E. When you watch this video, notice the simultaneous actions of Photos Dulos and Michelle Draconis. The coordination that after they have been sitting there a while, they open the door at the exact same time, conveniently at the right time to block the view from the tan car waiting to exit the parking lot. After we all, after, after all, we know what's in that suit. It's a license plate, the altered license plates. And it is reasonable to assume that the defendant, Michelle Traconis, did not want anyone from that tan car to see what, what they were doing. They didn't want a witness. What does she do next? At this exact moment, she opens her door. Well, she says it in her interviews. She wipes gum off of her hands onto the city sidewalk. Oh, shit. Is that reasonable? Or is it more reasonable that they didn't want anybody in the tan car to see photos to dispose of those altered license plates in the sewer? Coordination, conspiracy, and intentionally aiding. After all, who uses the city sidewalk to wipe their hands? As for the evidence that was tampered with, you have them. The license plate, the bloody ponchos, the gloves, the tool, the bloody towel, the mop, the zip ties that were cut, and her shirt and her bra sliced down the middle. 
Mm. Don't forget the bag. The bag that contained the defendant's DNA on the opening. That bag also contained blood-like stains and duct tape. And that duct tape had Jennifer's DNA on the sticky side of it. That The defendant's DNA on that bag shows her knowledge and her lives. It proves she's an accessory to tampering. Now, the defendant would have you believe she knew nothing of Fotis Doulis's acts, but look at the context. The police knock on her door that night, May 24th, 2019, when her daughter is not home. The police want to talk about her boyfriend being missing and they are her boyfriend's wife being missing. And they are in the middle of a contentious divorce and custody battle. If she were, if she didn't know anything, why would she hide in the bedroom? She wasn't hiding from the police that night. She was hiding from the truth. Is it more reasonable the next day at the hairdresser when she was happy and excited that she was happy and excited because she thought for a brief moment they got away with it? Or is it, well, then what happens? Photos to Lewis's phone gets taken. He can't get the kids that weekend. The plan they set in place, they start to crumble. She knew what was going on, ladies and gentlemen. Do you remember her joke in the interview? She made a joke about the fact that she said maybe she can have sex with Lotus while she's in jail or he's in jail. Watch the interviews again. Now, this is all before May 29th, before Russell Speeder. And this is the last count hindering prosecution where the state must prove, and we have proven, that she provided assistance to Fotis Dulos with intent to prevent, hinder, and delay and discover the crime the charge of murder. She assisted by providing transportation to him and other means. This is all about the Toyota Tacoma. Remember Pavel's testimony, how he hasn't spoken to Jennifer Dulos in years, and yet her DNA was on a blood-like stain that Matt Riley found on the seats. <clears throat> and remember Kristen Medell's testimony on how easily DNA can be destroyed with just wiping, let alone the cleaning solutions that they use at Russell Speeders. The defendant provided assistance and aid to Photos Dulos on May 29, 2019. She followed him to Russell Speeders that day in her rented Yukon. Fotis Dulos put down her phone number and they left the car wash together. The defendant got the call that the car was ready and she went back and went to the bank with him to pick up cash to pay for it. And she was with him to pick up the car. The evidence proves beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant intended to end her and Fotis Dulos two years of torture by murdering Jennifer Farber Dulos. She acted as his alibi during the murder. She conspired to tamper with the physical evidence of the murder, intentionally aided in covering it up at 80 Mountain Spring Road, at Albany Avenue in Hartford, and at Russell Speeders in Avon. The evidence shows the defendant is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of each and every count. Thank you. She did a great job, Ed. You're she nailed it. She nailed it. Yeah. No, no reasonable person can sit there and listen to that. And then after the presentation, I mean, they just went through so many weeks of evidence, right? And I mean, it's so concise. There's no holes in what she just presented. None whatsoever. I will say this. I wish they would have had proof of how photos got to where the Tacoma was parked from his house. Okay. Um, you know, he was dressed all in black. He had the bicycle pre-staged. Everything was ready for him. So, but how did he get from the house, his house where he lived to the house where the Tacoma was? They did they couldn't nail that down. Okay. But, you know, at that early morning, I mean, you hike through the woods, you can get there easily. You know, even though the defense said, well, you know, we took a drone to show you that it would have taken hours for him to, to traverse this, uh, wooded area to get to, no, that, that's all BS. If, if this person was committed to killing his wife, he had it all planned out, okay? I'm sh and he was concerned about the cameras 
um, and so forth uh, in in the houses around there. So, right. yeah. you know, it, it, it's not unthinkable that he, you know, donned his little black ninja outfit and then traversed through the woods to get there un, undetected and then get jumps into Ch Tacoma where the bike is already there and goes <laughs> to travel to kill his wife. Yeah. Yeah. She did a great job of laying it out, Michelle, and she did it clear and concise. And she was very, uh, in layman's terms, like she wasn't using the big word. She was just putting it out there. Um, I want to say hello to Richella Pranzo and Pete Pranzo. Uh, I know that, uh, uh, Richella is, uh, either set to have some surgery or something close, or I think she's getting knee surgery or has had it already. If she hasn't had it. I'm wishing her the best. Uh, for success, these things are relatively, um, you know, routine now. Like you yeah. know, it used to be back in and in out. Day. Yeah, it used to be back in the day. Now they put it in, they put the replacement in. They're like, all right, let's go. Uh, get out of here. Get up. Get walk around and get the hell out of here. Um, so yeah, just sending uh, sending her all our best. Uh, but look, so when um, the other district attorney steps into play here, Sean uh, McGinnis, uh, he goes second. And it's a lot. I'm not going to play it all. We don't have the time. But he lays out, you know, lots of um, deceit. The defendant repeatedly lies to investigators. I didn't see Fotis Dulos' phone in the morning. And it just goes on and on. He lays out those 30 or so points of, um, you know, of inconsistencies. Uh, and I really like that part of it. I, I'm, I'm hoping that I can get it. Yeah. So I'm going to get it right to that part over here. And this is the back end of it. So let's let this play. Um, just let us know in the chat if you watched. I mean, these, this closing, the closing arguments was all day long. Ed, did you, I, mean, I know you were in and out doing things, but did you listen to all of this? The whole thing. How many people in the chat listened to all of this, either live or on the replay? I was at work, so I couldn't listen to it all. I was being pulled in seven different directions today. But let's say hello to Jennifer Nobles and BB2, Popeye saying hello. Uh, Joey Brooklyn, our great mods who are in here. Dawn Marie, Joey Brooklyn, uh, Black Rose 11. So many great ones in the live chat tonight. And we love you. We appreciate you. If you're new, give us a chance. Hang out with us for 30 days. You got that you know money back guarantee if you don't like uh what you see you can just simply unsubscribe it's free to do that and it's free to subscribe so give us that 30-day challenge you won't be disappointed uh let's go and listen to prosecutor sean mcginnis lay out some of his he has the final word here he's got the final word and i really loved the, the ending uh of what he said is it really just a bunch of coincidences? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant answered Dulos' phone at Fort Jefferson Crossing when he was murdering his wife in Ukainim? Is it just a coincidence that Dulos' phone is being moved and manipulated when only the defendant is home? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant brought cleaning supplies to 80 Mountain Spring Road where you know the cleanup of its home was going on? Is it just a coincidence that the call from Greece is not in the defendant's timeline? Is it just a coincidence that during the cleanup, only hours after Jennifer is murdered, the defendant is shuttling back and forth between Fort Jefferson and 80 Mountain Spring Road? Is it just a coincidence during these trips back and forth, the defendant starts to fire at Fort Jefferson Crossing? Is it just a coincidence that during these trips back and forth, the defendant starts a second fire at Fort Jefferson Crossing? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant eventually lights a third fire at Fort Jefferson Crossing? Is it just a coincidence that while Dulos is cleaning the Tacoma, she takes a brown stained paper towel from him and throws it in the trash? Is it just a coincidence that despite no one telling her to, she took the keys to the Tacoma? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant travels with Dulos to Hartford as he disposes of the evidence on the same day? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant brought black garbage bags to Eddie Mountain and Jennifer's shirt and bra were found inside black trash bags? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant brought a green and yellow sponge shaving out in Spring Road and two of those were found in the trash in Hartford? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant brought a broom 
and the police found a mop or a broom handle in the trash at Albany Avenue in Hartford? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant opened the door to the rafter at the exact moment that Dulos exits the vehicle to dump those license plates in the sewer and block that other vehicle's view? Is it just a coincidence that despite her daughter not being home, the defendant panicked when the police came to the house, went to three separate rooms and said, I don't want to be here? By the way, if the police come to someone's door while their child is not home, would you expect a reasonable person to immediately go to the door to make sure the child is okay? Unless, of course, that person just knowingly committed a crime. Is it just a coincidence that the defendant followed Clovis to the car wash and then tried to lie about it? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant's phone number, and not Dulos's number, was used at the car wash? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant lied and said she showered with Dulos when he was actually en route to murder his wife? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant lied about seeing Dulos in the office again while he was in New Canaan murdering his wife? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant initially denied seeing Dulos's phone on the morning that Jennifer was murdered? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant said she saw Dulos meeting with Kent Winnie at Fort Jefferson Crossing around the time of Jennifer's murder, the same information that was in Dulos's timeline? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant never mentioned starting a fire to the police until they confronted her in the third and final interview? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant failed to mention that the Tacoma was at 80 Mountain Spring Road during her first two interviews? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant never mentioned that Dulos had watched the Tacoma during her first two interviews? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant answered the one call mentioned in Dulos's timeline on that morning? having been answered by him on the morning of his wife's murder? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant failed to tell police that Clovis Wilson's bicycle was at 80 Mountain Spring Road until the third and final interview? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant lied about not going back to 80 Mountain Spring Road to return those keys? Is it just a coincidence that Dulos told the Bell Committee to keep the defendant, quote, out of this? The committee brought up the defendant taking his keys. Is it just a coincidence that the defendant's DNA was found on the opening of a garbage bag that also contained blood stains, tape, and Jennifer Dulos's DNA? Are all these things just coincidences? Or is the defendant guilty? Now, during voir dire, we asked each of you, if the state proved its case beyond a reasonable doubt, would you be able to come out here and find the defendant guilty in open court? Each of you promised us that you could. We've done that. We've met our burden of proof in this case. Now, I want to show you, I have two minutes left here, the timelines. One last time, we're going to talk about these timelines. Now, Otis's is to the left, and the defendant's timelines are to the right. And they have been referred to as timelines, but they were really just a script, weren't they? And maybe some of you remember from English class in high school, every script has three acts, doesn't it? The first act was the premeditation and killing of Jennifer Dulos. The second act was the cover-up through the destruction of evidence and the defendant's lies. And now we've reached the third act, except she doesn't get to write it. You do. You write the third act of this script with your verdict. What's the ending going to be? Thank you. That was powerful at the end there. Um, yep, nailed it. So, folks in the chat, what did you, what was your thoughts on uh, Sean McGinnis's closing statement? It, I thought it was powerful. It was redundant. Thirty times over and over and over again yes it was tough to listen to but it hammered home all of these just a coincidence uh situations and there was 30 of them proven and pointed out to the jury proven during the course of this trial and then pointed out in the final uh in this final words um i, I thought it was fantastic i thought the the you know, the female, the male together, Michelle and um, Prosecutor Sean 
they did a great job. And I think that we will see possibly tomorrow. Uh, this jury is tired. They want to go home, man. Uh, but they're not going to rush through it just because they're tired. Um, what I'm saying is, is they have everything they need. And um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we see uh, a verdict come down tomorrow uh, or sometime, you know, before the before Friday, for sure. But I, I'm, I'm predicting tomorrow. Well, you know, they were asked to do a lot of things. They were asked to re revisit and look at all these different exhibits. OK, look at these videos. They were asked to do that by, by the prosecution themselves. Let's see if they do it. If they don't do it um, and if they don't do it, that means they. You know, I think they they don't need it. They understand, and they're going to come to the uh, conclusion relatively fast. Yeah, you know, and 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 most of these, like I said, most of these jurors, they they have had you know a, a heck of a go here, listening to that uh, defense attorney back and forth with the delays and with all of the you know excuses and uh, you know excusing the jury and sending them out of the room so they can have arguments and sidebars and so forth it's just you know they they're getting to work and some folks in the chat earlier asked can are the jury deliberating all night and all day no they're coming back tomorrow at 10 a.m correct ed i think he said uh judge said he ordered them back at 10 a.m uh everybody back into the court uh, for and, and well, not into the courtroom, but to, for deliberating, they'll be in the deliberation room at 10 a.m. tomorrow. Uh, is, that's what I heard. I could be wrong. Somebody in the chat knows. Let me know. I'm only human, uh, but I, I did. I do think that I heard 10 a.m. So um, let's take a listen. Let's make sure. O'clock all along. Otherwise, it would be difficult to digest those instructions as the court is reading it and you are trying to listen. We will stand in our lunch and recess. Please do not discuss the case. Okay, yeah, this is an Please do not. Yeah, I think he said 10 a.m. Um, who does mm -hmm. this judge remind you of, Ed? Voice wise. Well, I don't think it's, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I heard people, I don't think it's Morgan Freeman. I, do I, I don't want to get a copyright strike, but I could just pull up uh, Bruce Almighty and you know, you'll you'll get to hear it. So, anyways, all right, yeah. So Debbie Carroll, she's been listening to this trial. She's been on all of the live chats, uh, Court TV, um, uh, Law and Crime. I've seen her around in all of them. So Debbie, thank you for that. Thank you for backing me up. Uh, Kristen says I do. Um, yeah. Morgan Freeman. All right, Ed. That's it. He has such a distinctive voice, Morgan Freeman, and you know. Why he does all those Talk commercials. To anyone about the case, and we plan to see you at two o'clock. Okay, Morgan. Um, <laughs> Just Judge Morgan to you. Yeah, thank you. Hold on a second. Stop breathing down my neck. Wallace. Okay, uh, Turkey. Yeah, he's a, a great judge, and I think he handled this trial with respect, and he had complete control of his courtroom. Um, and I think he did a bang up job. Let's go. Hashtag Ed, hashtag duty, Ron. Let's do a quick rapid fire of the questions and then I'll pull up the poll and I'll let you guys know what we got. So put your questions in the chat. Hashtag Ed, hashtag duty, Ron. I, we, we kind of ran out of time. I would love to have one or two people come up with us, but I'd like to do it this way because we can get to more people fast. So hashtag Ed, hashtag duty, Ron. I'll look for the poll. Let me pull it up. Live stream. Yeah, as you as you're pulling that up, I love how the judge refers to himself as the court. The court doesn't believe the court. I love it. This. I love that. <laughs> yeah. According to the the court does not. Yeah, he he. I come to really enjoy his voice. It's very very soothing, very uh, very relaxing. All right, so we have a thousand votes. Folks, Jolene Marie is saying great, very good judge. Jennifer Nobles from Bakersfield, California, my good friend and a platinum member on this channel. We have Ed, we have 11 platinum members. That's the highest tier that you can be a member in. And Jennifer Nobles, one of them, 
And I have a whole list and I'm going to call them out this weekend. All of our platinum members are going to get a special shout out on one of our public live streams because those 12, 11 or 12, I think it's 11, um, those 11 are really, they've gone the extra, extra step. So thank you to the Platinum, Duty Ron, and Ed Wallace members. Ed, are you falling asleep on us? Hold on a second. Hold on. Let me wake up Ed. Hold on. Where is he? Bad boys, bad boys. What's he going to do? What's he going to do when they come for you? There you go. Yeah, well, that wakes that up right away. As soon as we play that, he's just like, it's right into the cop mode. Um, I love reggae. Yeah. All right. So 1,005 votes. We asked this question of our audience before we went live. And I'm going to go full screen with me. I know this is a lot to take in. Oof. Duty Ron. Um, 1,006 votes. It keeps swelling. Uh, we asked, what will the verdict be for Michelle Traconis? And the choices were guilty, not guilty, and a hung jury. 84% guilty, not guilty, a small 6%. And over 10% are saying hung jury, Ed. So we got more hung jury uh, votes than not guilties. Interesting, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Ed has some moves, says JoJo. Uh, you guys hey, Ron to... has Ron has some new sound effects. He's you know one of my favorite movies is Forrest Gump, and he's got a whole bunch of new Forrest Gump uh, sound. Effects. My mom always said life was like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. Mm -hmm. My name is Forrest. Say about that. Yes, and that's right. all I have to say about that. And, and since I was. Okay there, Turkey. And that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> and since I was a gazillionaire, I mowed that grass for free. Hold on. Ed, I got something to say to you. Go ahead. Make my day. <laughs> all right. Um, well, are you so feeling lucky? Joyce Punk? just said, I knew Ed was cool. So mm -hmm. there you go. Um, Taz says, I, I love reggae too. You make me laugh, Ed and Ron. Well, that's what it's about. Okay, we've got 1,019 votes. It's swelling. Guilty, 84%. Not guilty, 5%. And hung jury, 10%. So um, I want to wrap the poll up before we wrap up this live stream. But I want to also give away five more. That would be 15 free memberships. Make sure you hit the thumbs up. Let's get the thumbs up closer to 1,000. We're at 577 likes. As soon as we get that, those like numbers up, I'll give away more free members. I'm going to keep watching it. Ed, you see Susie Blue, Ski, Blue Sky? Yeah. Susie Blue Sky. Yeah. So she says, Ed, how did the license plates down the sewer fit in? I got confused. Well, here's the deal. Those license plates belong to Fotis. It was this old Suburban. He altered those plates with blue tape to change a few letters and numbers and the theory is he put them on Fotis's Tacoma front and back to um, when he was driving down um, to murder his wife and come back from the murder. So uh, after that, he took the plates off Fotis's car and put them in that FedEx package and was driving around Hartford and ditched them with uh, Michelle. There you go. Thank you for answering that, Ed. Uh, Yari says, duty, Ron and Ed, are you guys going to cover the Brian Kohlberger hearing tomorrow? He's got a, like, a, I'm, I'm not sure exactly. I think it, this is going to be the stepping stone to a trial date perhaps, but unless it's something earth shattering, we're, we won't cover that because we're awaiting, you know, this trial, the commencement of the trial. And, um, I, I don't, I really don't feel like unless it's something earth shattering, that we need to cover it. Um, but thank you for thank you for bringing that up. Uh, do you mean the red truck? Ed? Yeah, the, the, the Tacoma is the red truck. There you go. There you go. Uh, that's Paulie's uh, Tacoma. And you know, there's a lot of people who feel like there's more involved in this um, that they had help, and we heard it laid out here. We heard the potentiality for other people being involved, and these. These two rich folks, and that's what I'm going to refer to them as, Fotis Dulos, 
you know, rich, but in debt and, and not in a good financial way, in debt to the Barber family of millions of dollars, arguably, right? Um, they don't like to do dirty work. And that's why I was surprised that we saw photos Dulos throwing out the bags in Hartford and going around and doing that dirty work. Granted, he's in construction, but I don't really think he was get my hands kind of dirty kind of guy. Um, you know, this he's was like you, Ed, where you this know, this was personal for him, though. This was personal, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it was deep hatred here, deep hatred, deep uh, hatred on general. behalf of both of them, right? Ed, uh, mm -hmm. we heard uh, that you know. Uh, Michelle Traconis referred to Jenna Dulos and used the B word, right? Mm -hmm. And she said that she should be buried with a dog. The, you know the, what made me sick? I don't know if you saw this today. Was the uh, the photo? Oh, sorry, Ed. What happened to you? Where did, did you, you go? Do? Okay. okay no, I, I I don't know. I, I removed you by mistake. Go ahead. The photo. The photo of photos. His children. Um, I guess it was a nanny. And uh, Michelle Traconis down in, uh, I guess it was Miami Beach, uh, um, on vacation with Jennifer wasn't present um, there. Uh, yeah, that made me sick. You know, yeah. that, that, that made me sick. And then the, the defense attorney, he did say this, and I want to, he, he said this absence of evidence. This is the way the phrase is. Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Just because myself as a crime scene invest investigator didn't find evidence of your presence at a location or in a vehicle or whatever the case may be, doesn't mean you weren't there. Yeah. All it yeah. means is I didn't find it. Despite being so anal that I shit diamonds. Oh, my. Wow. Hold on a second. Oh, really? Ed Wallace shits diamonds. Um. Angela, our good friend, Angela S. says, hashtag, Ed, hashtag duty run. Wondering if you're going to cover the Russ trial. I'm guessing maybe not. Um, we we never covered it, even from the beginning. Um, but, it you know, it's interesting. We're, I'm watching that case from the side. Um, I, I really am going to be interested to see what happens in, with this first trial. And then I want to see what happens to the main guy uh, who pulled the trigger and there's no question in our minds that he didn't, he had to have pulled the trigger on that weapon to, to kill uh, Elena Hutchinson. So it, it is what it is. We're not covering it. Uh, I, I'm not really sure, but JB says, Hey, great, great show. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Deb is asking us if we're going to cover the Dorman trial. That's the father who took his rifle and shot his kids. Uh, horrific. We don't have any plans to cover it, but we are watching it closely, and we're hoping that justice is served. Um, let's see. Otis was a grifter, says Tiffany Knox. Uh, Debbie Carroll, who's following this case very closely, she read that Fotis Dulos had $272 in two bank accounts when he died far from rich. Yeah, yeah, there's some, you know, they did his financial background on him in the trial. So right. uh, if you guys want to go back and uh, look at that on uh, in the YouTube videos of the trial, you'll see how much he actually had and how much he owed a lot of people. Oh, yeah. A lot of people, including his in-laws. He's part of the, 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 the working poor, I guess, or whatever you want to call him. Mad Wabbit says, hashtag Ron and Ed. How did Jennifer's phone connect to the parked car? Who had her phone? Well, it wasn't proven that it was her phone, all right, because Fotos was in that car uh, at at one point too, um, and there was some some talk or some uh, by an expert that said you know that Fotos could have had a Bluetooth connected to this to this car. Curious Kiwi comes in with a free member for twelve months. Thank you, member for a free membership sh chat. She says, if we get a thousand thumbs, I'll gift some free memberships. Well, Ooh. Curious Kiwi, uh, you asked a question about Tacomas. Yes, Tacoma is the most popular midsize pickup truck in the United States, okay, um, from Toyota. I have a test. They don't, they don't, yeah, my son, I bought my son one, a Toyota Tacoma. Um, oh, they don't sell, what's that? I thought you bought your son a Tesla. 
No, I bought him a Toyota Tacoma. I'm a Toyota guy. I own a Toyota Sequoia. Okay. Um, I've seen it. Yes. My, um, I was going to say, in outside of the United States, uh, one of the most popular pickups around the world is uh, Toyota. Um, I forgot the name of it, though. It's just, it, it's a it's a really popular Toyota pickup truck, but they can't sell it here in the United States for some reason. So instead of that pickup truck that you can get in Australia, New Zealand, um, parts of Asia, all over the Middle East and Africa, um, you uh, we have the Tacoma. Right. Oh, the Helix. That's right, the Helix. The Helix. Very popular, uh, very popular automobile, and, uh, and, and Toyota really makes good good vehicles. I've never owned one. Uh, I, I've owned Nissan, which is like kind of almost like one and the same, right? But mm -hmm. um, built well. Uh, Tundra. Tundra's uh, the pickup truck that's sold here in the United States. It's the Helix uh, that's sold overseas and around the world, but they can't sell, Toyota can't sell that pickup truck here. Yeah. Sweet One says, uh, love Ron's Tesla. Yeah, I've uploaded some Christmas. It does like a whole light show. Schmitty was actually sitting in the passenger seat in my Tesla. I picked her up from the train station. Schmitty came in from out of town for her 50th birthday celebration. It wasn't her exact birthday. She came to New York City for her 50th with her girlfriends, and I picked her up in the New High Park train station and drove her to Umberto's. We met with Joey Brooklyn, Diane B. from across the street, my neighbor, myself, and we broke some bread with Schmitty Schmacks. Okay. Um, let's see. We're getting ready to wrap it up. 1,082 votes. 84% said guilty. 6% says not guilty. And still 10% hanging on to that hung jury. Really, a lot of people feel that there, there's a potentiality for a hung jury. Hmm, interesting. Uh, we're up to 650 likes. If we can get that up to 800, I'll even cut it back from 1,000 so I can... Ed and I can gift five more or maybe 10 more free memberships. Let's get those thumbs up. I'm watching it real time. Uh, Ann says, do you have to be? What? You, have, you to have to be, be here for so long to get a badge. How long do you have to be here to get a badge? Well, that's you have to become a member. So instead of just subscribing, which is free, there's a membership tiers. So the people that you see with the badges, um, like Ant BB2, is she's a member and she's been a member for a long time uh and like here you see that badge there these are all members who are channel members and we do members only exclusive lives and a lot of different things for our memberships we love our folks who take that extra step oh and by the way uh, I'm working with Equisearch Midwest uh, we are the law enforcement liaison with them um, um, but I'm working with Dave and Twyla. We're going to do another fundraiser in April. And I know, Ed, you'll be outside the country, but we're going to do a marathon fundraiser. It's going to be all of the Super Chats and donations on that live stream are going to go directly, not to me, all of it, no money taken out by anybody. If you donate $5, they get $5. Uh, it's all going to be uh, probably April 1st. Um, maybe we won't do it April Fool's Day. Maybe we'll do it April 2nd. And uh, <laughs> and we'll do the live stream. Ed, you were there in 2021. We were four hours on That's the right. air. We, you know, we, this year's a leap year, right? There you go. So this, this year's a leap year. So if you're Irish, you know what that means. So, uh, But also, it also means that my birthday is now one day further away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah the ed's birthday is friday That's so right. yeah i have to wait an extra day for my birthday it's it, it's it's a tough one but, but hopefully i'll get to celebrate it with you on saturday um that's right that's right ed and i should be getting together in person on saturday all right a thousand one eleven hundred and four votes still 84 percent six and ten um we got close we're not really there yet um but i don't want to end this without Given, Happy birthday, Maria. Yeah, I don't want to end this without giving out a, a couple of more um, free memberships. So if you'd like to be a member, put a one in the chat. Make sure you're subscribed and say something nice to us. And I will. Ed, do you think my credit card is going to go through? The one you just stole? Yeah, that's fine. They didn't oh. report it yet. Hold on a second. Stop breathing down my neck. Lieutenant Diane. Lieutenant Diane. 
Ice cream, Lieutenant Dan, ice cream. All right. All right. All right. Hold on a second. Go ahead. Make my day. Get off of my face. Blow it out your ass. 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 George Collins. Listen, I'm going to pack that stuffing so hard up your turkey, you, you'll never be able to blow it out. Blow it out your ass. <laughs> My mom always said life was like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. And since oh, I was thirsty. Punch, but you're an asshole. You're all over the map. Yeah, I can't help it. I want to hit every one of the buttons. I got 32 of them here. Hold on. All right, let's uh, let's end this an hour and 26 minutes. I want to thank everybody. I'm going to close the poll out. 1117 votes. This the numbers stay 84 6 not guilty, 84% guilty, 10% hung jury, 6% not guilty. Let's hope for a fair and just verdict. The jury will be back at 10 a.m. tomorrow deliberating and we will be watching it. We'll watch it closely. And when the verdict comes, we will try to bring it to you live. If we can't, we'll we'll talk about it probably at the end of the day. All right, Ed. You always got something great to say to the folks. Uh, we'll leave it up to you, Ed. All right. Thank you, folks, for being here with us and sharing your valuable time with us. Keep spreading the word about Duty Ron and myself. And, join, and have your friends come join us and join our fr- our true crime family. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. I always say at the end of the show, please be safe, be prepared and watch your six. Amen to that brother. And I want to thank everybody for being here, for telling your friends and family about our community. Thank you so much for the engagement and keep the questions coming. Let's continue the conversation in the comment section down below underneath all the videos. Just put a question in there and we will get to it and we'll answer it. Good night from New York City, and I'm hoping for justice for Jennifer Dulos, Jennifer Farber Dulos. I don't even like to use that Dulos. Yeah, don't use the last name Jennifer no more. Farber, mother of five, murdered May 24th of 2019. Good night from New York, and thank you. We'll see you guys soon. Peace and love from Crime Time with Duty Ron and Wallace.